as the people of the book, as Seventh-day Adventists, we base, we base what we believe on, what, on the, what the Word of God says, right? The spirit of prophecy is the lesser light to point to the greater light. We are to base our belief on the Word of God, yes? And since we based our belief on the Word of God last night, what I thought for us, it will be good for us this morning as uh, Seventh-day Adventists is to look at the history of our denomination. What did we believe? What did the founders of, what did the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church believe and teach? And how did the Trinity that we have come to believe on today enter into the church? So my endeavor is to summarize the, uh, you know, over 160 years of history in one hour. Uh, it is impossible to do. I'm going to miss a lot of stuff, but I'm just putting some highlights in there. If you'd like to know, I've divided the presentation into three segments. Number one is looking at the writings of Sister White, the prophet of the Lord. What did she believe? What did she teach? Uh, from the year she was called into the prophetic office to the year she died, 1915. What did she believe in progressive years? Uh, these statements are taken from a book called The Godhead in Black and White. You can find it on our website, revelation1412.org. You find a book called The Godhead in Black and White. There's many more statements. I've just taken a sample. The second uh, part of the presentation is looking at what the pioneers uh, of the Adventist Church believed and taught on this topic, on the Godhead topic and the Trinity. Again, you can find many more of these statements in a book called uh, The Living Voice of the Lord's Witnesses, found on our website as well, The Living Voice of the Lord's Witnesses. And the last part, uh, it's just looking at some letters and some facts of how the Trinity came in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's not a, an exhaustive investigation, but just a little bit to give you a bit of a taste, a flavor, and you can go do your own investigation after that. Amen? Amen. So it's a history lesson this morning. There'll be a lot of reading. We're examining the writings of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, right? So we'll be doing a lot of writing. I've put all the statements with the references on the screen in front of you. You can see it, write the references, ask me after for the slides, I'll give them to you. You can go check them in their context and see for yourself. Now, uh, the first thing that uh, we have to understand, you have to understand, is Ellen White was not born a Seventh-day Adventist. She wasn't. There was no such thing when she was born. She grew up in a Methodist home. She belonged to the Methodist faith. Now, Methodist people believe in the following. The God they worship is, they say, there is but one living and true God, everlasting, without body or parts, of infinite power, wisdom, and goodness, the maker and preserver of all things, visible and invisible. And in unity of this Godhead, there are three persons of one substance, power and eternity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So it's important as we investigate what Ellen White came to believe and teach. It's important to understand where she came from. Ellen White, growing up, was a Trinitarian before she was called into the prophetic office, right? Now we want to see what she taught when she was called into the prophetic office. She tells us, and now to all who have a desire of, for truth, I would say do not give credence to unauthenticated reports as to what Sister White has done or said or written. If you desire to know what the Lord has revealed through her, read what? Read her published writings. So if we want to know what she believed and we thought we ought to read her published writings, not what somebody tells me. Well, I think she said this. I think she believed it. I don't care what anybody thinks. I want to know what she thought and what she wrote. So we're going to look at her published writings. We're going to look at uh, uh, a progressive uh, years of what she wrote, beginning, uh, I divided them into segments here. You can see 1827 to 62 and so forth, different segments. We'll take them one segment at a time, finishing with the last segment from 1905 to 1915, the year she died. Just make sure you can see the screen because we'll be reading from the screen. If you can't see on this side, please shift to this side. Make your move now. All right. 
What was understood and revealed in regard to Christ in those early years? What does she have to say? She tells us, but the Son of God who was with the Father before the world was, took pity upon us in our lost condition and offered to step in between us and the wrath of an offended God. That's in 1852. So Ellen White says that the Son of God, He was before the world was. He was with the Father. Who was with the Father? Son of God. She didn't say there was a, a second, uh, a co-equal, co-eternal God called God the Son who was with God. The, no, no, no. She said the Son of God was with the Father before anything was created. She also says, And I saw that when God said to His Son, Let us make man in our image, Satan was jealous. Now, uh, let us make man in our image. Where is that found? Genesis, right? I've heard so many interpretations. People will say, and theologians and pastors and preachers, let us see us. Us is plural. In Hebrew, plural is not two, but three and more, right? Well, the prophet, prophet of the Lord said, God said to his son, let us. Who was talking? God the Father. Who was he talking to? His son, and told him, let us. Father and Son make man in our image. That's why they created two, Adam and Eve, in the image of two, the Father and the Son, right? <coughs> okay, therefore, how many divine occupants are on the heavenly throne? What does she say? In February 1845, I had a vision of events commencing with the midnight cry. I saw a throne, and on it sat the Father and the how many beings sit on the throne? Two. Now, uh, uh, for uh, many of us, many Adventists, we don't uh, realize that before Ellen White, God called two people. Are you aware of that? The first one rejected to, tell, uh, to say what God uh, told him, and hence he was rejected. And the second one was by the name of William Foy. He was a black man, and he, was, he had visions, and he went sharing some visions. And one time... Uh, because he was black at that time, there was difference white and black and all these issues in America. He, it was very hard for him to share what God had laid on his heart. So because it was so hard, God called somebody else and revealed visions to Ellen White. And one time when Ellen White was sharing one of her visions, she says this, this guy, tall and big, you know, they were in a room, a low ceiling. She says he was jumping up and down at the back and saying, hey man, and hallelujah. And, and she spoke to him after and he told her that God revealed to him the same visions. In one of his visions, he says, At the right side of the mountain appeared a mighty angel. That's what he saw in the vision, William IV, right? With raiment like unto burnished gold. His legs were like pillars of flaming fire. His countenance was like the lightning, and his crown gave light to this boundless place. And those that had not passed through death could not look upon his countenance. I then beheld upon the side of this mountain letters like pure gold, which said what? The father. the father and the son. Directly under these letters stood the mighty angel whose crown lighted up the place and all the heavenly hosts worshiped at his feet round about the mountain. So William Foy, who was called into the prophetic office before Ellen White was called, saw the same thing. In heaven is written, Father and Son. On the throne sits two beings, the Father and His Son. Not three beings as we have come to believe today. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. No, two beings, the Father and the Son. The prophet of the Lord said that, and the one who was called into the prophetic office before her said that too. And you can check Revelation as well. John the Revelator saw only two in heaven. God and the Lamb. <coughs> but we can see that probably later in the uh, other presentations. The next stage is 1862 to 1876. Who is the lawgiver and what is his name? Ellen White tells us, God is a moral governor as well as a father. He is the lawgiver. So according to Ellen White, the father is the lawgiver. Who was next in authority to the great Jehovah, the lawgiver? Ellen White tells us, the Son of God was next in authority to the great lawgiver. He was in the express image of his father, 
not in features only, but in perfection of character. So God, the lawgiver, God the Father, the lawgiver was there, and next in authority was who? His son. Who was next in honor to the Son of God? If there was three co-equal, co-eternal, you would think the Holy Spirit, right? Let's see what she says. Satan in heaven before his rebellion was a high and exalted angel next in honor to God's dear son. God the Father next in authority was his son, not God the Son, the Son of God. And next in authority was Lucifer, the mightiest created angel before he fell. And probably now Gabriel took his place. It wasn't Father and Son and then God the Holy Spirit. As we saw last night from Scripture, there is no such... As a matter of fact, if you look through the whole Bible and through all the writings of Ellen White, you will not find the terms God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. They do not exist. They don't. I mean, it's, you don't have to be a genius. Just get a computer, have the program of the Bible, program of Ellen White, search the words God the Holy Spirit. You won't find it. It doesn't exist. It's not there. Right? <coughs> it's a man-made terminology. She goes on to say, The great creator assembled the heavenly host that he might, in the presence of all the angels, confer special honor upon his son. The son was seated on the throne with the father, and the heavenly throng of holy angels was gathered around them. The father then made known that it was ordained by himself that Christ, his son, should be equal with himself, so that wherever was the presence of his son, it was as his own presence. The word of the Son was to be obeyed as readily as the word of the Father. All these things, brothers and sisters, took place before man was even created. Do you know that? Jesus is not the Son of God because he was born of Mary. Before the whole human race was created, Jesus or Christ was the Son of God in heaven. Amen? Who did Adam and Eve, who were created in the image of the Father and the Son, love, praise, and adore? In the next presentation, we have a whole presentation Nader will share with us about Adam and Eve. But just one statement, who did Adam and Eve in the Garden of... By the way, do you think in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve knew who God is? Do you think they were deceived to worship a false god in the Garden of Eden before sin existed? No, the purest form of worship from human beings to divinity is found in the Garden of Eden. Who did they worship? Let's see what the prophet says. Adam and Eve united with them, that is the angels, and raised their voices in harmonious songs of love, praise, and adoration to the Father and His dear Son for the tokens of love which surrounded them. Adam and Eve praised and worshipped two beings. Who are they? Father and Son. They did not worship three beings, Father, Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They didn't do that. The angels didn't do that. Adam and Eve didn't do that. I hope you don't do that either. Was Satan unaware of Christ's position in heaven? Angels that were loyal and true sought to reconcile this mighty, rebellious angel to the will of his creator. That's after he started rebelling. They, the good angels, clearly set forth that Jesus was the Son of God existing with him before the angels were created and that he had ever stood at the right hand of God. You see, when Lucifer was rebelling, he was saying, hang on, why should, why should this Jesus be, you know, uh, regarded higher than I am? Why should he be conferred with more honor than I am? And the angels, the loyal angels, went to him and said, listen, before you even were created, this Son of God, Jesus, is the Son of God. He was with Him before He even were created. It's a fact that Jesus is the Son of God. The angels were telling Lucifer. 76 to 91. Who is the source of all being and the center of authority and power? The Ancient of Days is God the Father. It is He, the source of all being and the fountain of all law that is to preside in the judgment. God the Father <coughs> is the source of all law. He is the ancient of days. The reason uh, we're going through progressive years, it's because 
most theologians today and pastors in the Adventist church have come to admit, they can escape it, they have come to admit, yes, Ellen White was an anti-Trinitarian, but she changed later in her years when she published the book, The Desire of Ages. We will get there, but we're taking it through the years to show that she believed the same thing over and over. Before she was called into prophetic office, she believed in the Trinity, but when she was called to the prophetic office, she no longer believed that. She believed the truth. Is there a place for gods in heaven? There is no place for gods in heaven above. God is the only true God. He fills all heaven. Those who now submit to his will shall see his face and his name will be in their foreheads of all who are pure and holy. Whose name will be written in the foreheads of those who are pure and holy? Revelation 14, verse 1. Remember, I saw a lamb, and next to him 144,000, and on their foreheads was written the name of the Father. He is the only true God, as we saw last night clearly from the Bible. <coughs> Who is the only being in the entire universe that was admitted to the Father's counsel? Now, <laughs> I, I know I'm speeding through it, but, but I, I want it to resonate a bit. I want you to understand something. If there was three co-eternal, co-equal beings or persons in heaven, I mean, it only makes sense that the three of them were supposed to enter the council, right? Listen to what the prophet says. Christ, the Word, the only begotten of God, was one with the eternal Father, one in nature, in character, and in purpose, the only being in all the universe that could enter into all the councils and purposes of God. So Christ is the only being in all the universe that could enter into the councils of God. There was no other being that was allowed to enter. Who does the believer receive when imbued with the Holy Spirit? When the believer receives the Holy Ghost, who does he receive? We read, all professions of Christianity are but lifeless expressions of faith until Jesus imbues the believer with his spiritual life, which is the Holy Ghost. The evangelist is not prepared to teach the truth and to be the representative of Christ till he has received this heavenly gift. So who is the Holy Ghost according to Ellen White? It is Christ's spiritual life. It is his life. It's not another being. It is his life. That's 1878. Who alone shared the throne of the supreme ruler of the universe? The Son of God shared the Father's throne and the glory of the eternal self-existent one encircled both. This statement, if you actually think about it, she's saying there is only one who is eternal and self-existent. She says the glory of the eternal and self-existent one encircled both. So Jesus Christ sat on his father's throne and the glory of the self-existent one, the glory of the father encircled both. Amen? Okay, 91 to 1900. Who is the Holy Spirit? Cumbered with humanity, Christ could not be in every place personally. Therefore, it was altogether for their advantage that he should leave them, go to his Father, and send the Holy Spirit to be his successor on earth. The Holy Spirit is who? Is himself divested of the personality of humanity and independent thereof. He would represent himself as present in all places by his Holy Spirit as the omnipresent. Look. If Ellen White was to come back to life today, and she come to New Zealand, to Wellington, to this camp, she comes up the front here, and she wants to tell you, listen, the Holy Spirit is not a third God, it is Christ himself. She cannot say it in any clearer words that the English language will allow her than these words. She said, listen, the Holy Spirit is himself, referring to Christ. The Holy Spirit is Christ himself, but without the human form. That's what she's saying, divested of the humanity, percent of humanity. She cannot say it any clearer than as we saw last night also. Paul, same thing, if he's to come to life today and he wants to tell you that the Holy Spirit is Christ, 
he told her there is only one Lord, it is Jesus Christ in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 6. And in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 17, he says, Now the Lord, who is the one Lord? Jesus. The Lord or Jesus is that spirit. He can't say it any clearer and blunter than that. <coughs> Ellen White said the same, what Paul said. Who is our comforter? We saw some of this last night as well. The Savior is our comforter. This I have proved him to be. She also says, the reason why the churches are weak and sickly and ready to die is that the enemy has brought influences of a discouraging nature to bear upon trembling souls. He has sought to shut Jesus from their view as the comforter. So who is the comforter? Jesus. Jesus is our comforter. How are the Father and the Son one? From eternity, there was a complete unity between the Father and the Son. There were two, yet little short of being identical to an individuality, yet one in spirit and heart and character. She says they are little short of being, they are not identical, the Father and the Son. The prophet says, I haven't seen them. The prophet has. Well, in vision, she's been taken and she's been instructed. She said they are little short of being identical. They are two, but they are one in spirit. Two beings, not one. How is Christ the Son of God? I want you to listen to this statement. She says, a complete offering has been made for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Not a son by creation, as the angels were, nor a son by adoption, as is the forgiven sinner, but a son begotten, in the express image of the Father's person and in all the brightness of His majesty and glory. Pause for a second. Some people would like to take this statement and apply it to the incarnation, Bethlehem, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Read what the statement says. She says, He was but a son begotten in the express image of the Father's person in all the brightness of His majesty and glory. Question. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, was he born with all the glory that divinity offers him? Every human being on earth would die if Jesus came in all his glory. This is not talking about the incarnation. It's talking about when he was born in the days of eternity, as we saw last night from the scriptures. He was born in the express image of the Father's person and glory. Who are the only ones that we are to exalt? Again, the Father and the Son alone are to be exalted. As John tells us, our fellowship is only with the Father and the Son in 1 John. Who covenanted to redeem man? Before the foundation of the earth were laid, the Father and the Son had united in a covenant to redeem man if he should be overcome by Satan. They had clasped their hands in a solemn pledge that Christ should become the surety for the human race. The father and the son clasped or they shook hands in agreement that if man falls, Christ will die. The father and the son, two beings, covenant to save man. Is the breath and the spirit of Christ a different individual being to Christ? This is, by the way, the past few statements, and this one is taken from the book Desire of Ages, that some people claim that in this book she turned the ship around and she turned from non-Trinitarian to Trinitarian in this book. Well, we're looking at some statements. This statement, for example, she says, Christ gives them, the, his followers, the breath of his own spirit, the life of his own life. The Holy Spirit is the life of Christ, she's saying. Is my life a different person than me? Who's preaching today, me or my life? We're the same, right? We're the same. Christ gives his own life, the life of his own life to his followers. Is that a different being? It's not. <coughs> anyway, let's press on. 1900 to 1905. When God gives us his spirit, does he give us someone else different to him? In giving us his spirit, God gives us himself. She goes on to say in another place, this comforter is the Holy Spirit, the soul of his life. It is the soul of his life. What is the relation between God and Christ? What has Christ been given? She tells us, God is the Father of Christ. Christ is the Son of God. To Christ has been given 
an exalted position, he has been made equal with the Father. All the counsels of God are open to his Son. How was, God, how was Jesus given this position and nature? We saw last night. It was by inheritance because he was born of the Father in the days of eternity. Who is more human, you or your son? Same. Who is more divine, God or his son? The same. Jesus inherited all authority and power and nature from his father because he was begotten <coughs> of the father. How are Christ and God one? Christ is one with the father, but Christ and God are two distinct personages. So read the prayer of Christ in the 17th chapter. If you jump to the end, the highlighted yellow, I just want to speed up to get to the other segment. She says the powers of Christ they are to be one with him as he is one with the father. We are to be one with Christ as Christ is one with the Father. All right. 1905 to 1915. The year she died is 1915. <coughs> what fact were the fallen angels seeking to obscure in heaven? Angels were expelled from heaven because they would not work in harmony with God. They fell from their high state because they wanted to be exalted. They had come to exalt themselves and they forgot that their beauty of person and of character came from the Lord Jesus. This fact, the angels or fallen angels would obscure that Christ was the only begotten Son of God. What fact was Lucifer and the fallen angels trying to obscure? What did she say? The Christ is the only begotten Son of God. Is it a wonder that today Satan has managed among Christians to obscure the fact that Christ is the only begotten Son of God by introducing another idea called the Trinity, which makes Christ another co-eternal and co-equal God with the Father, that meaning He is not His Son because He did not come out of from Him? It's obscuring the same fact that Satan tried to obscure in heaven. Christ is not the Son of God. That's what they're trying to obscure. Who are the only ones that know what our salvation cost? She tells us, God and Christ alone know what the souls of men have cost. No third being. When Christ spoke of the Spirit, was He speaking of a different person? It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are Spirit and they are life. Christ is not here referring to his doctrine, but to his person, the divinity of his character. So when Christ spoke about the Holy Spirit, he was talking about what? His person. It is his person. Is the Holy Spirit described as a third being besides God and Christ? They have one God and one Savior and one Spirit, the Spirit of Christ is to bring unity into their ranks. One the God, one Savior, and one Spirit. Who is the Spirit? It is the Spirit of Christ. It's not another being other than Christ. Okay, last statement. Did Ellen White confess a change in the foundation of truth? She says, the evidence given in our early experience has the same force that it had then. The truth is the same as it ever has been and not a pin or a pillar can be moved from the structure of truth. That which has sought for out of that word in 1844, 45, and 46 remains the truth in every particular. What God revealed to his prophet in the early years, as we saw throughout her progressive years, is still the same. What was truth back then is still truth today. She came from a Trinitarian background, and she became a non-Trinitarian worshiping the Father and the Son. And she remained there until she died. Uh, she died. She remained worshipping the Father and the Son, the true God of the Bible. What about the pioneers, the founders of the Adventist church? Who did they believe and what did they teach? James White, the husband of Ellen White. Listen to what he says. Neither are the Father and the Son parts of the three one God. They are two distinct beings, yet one in the 
design and accomplishment of redemption. The redeemed from the first who shares in the great redemption to the last, all ascribe the honor and glory and praise of their salvation to both God and the Lamb. James White tells you, uh, God is not the part of one of three. No, there's God and there is His Son. There are two distinct beings. He also says, the Father was greater than the Son in that He was first. The Son was equal with the Father in that He had received all things from the Father. Now, uh, it's important to understand when, when uh, you're dealing with uh, some theologians and some pastors and, and whatnot, they will tell you that the Adventist pioneers, yes, they did not believe in the Catholic Trinity, but they believed in the Adventist Trinity. There is no ism, tri Trinitarianism, Tritheism, Unitarian, whatever you want to call it. There's no ism that will believe what this man said. The Father was first. The Father was before the Son. No ism, Trinitarianism, Tritheism accepts that. He did not believe in any Trinitarian philosophy. John Andrews, he says, And as to the Son of God, he would be excluded also, for he had God for his Father, and did at some point in the eternity of the past have beginning of days. You understanding what these people say? John Andrew is saying that Jesus had beginning of days, in the days of eternity. When was that? When he was begotten or brought forth from his father. As we saw in scriptures last night, Proverbs chapter 8. John Loughborough, he says, they, he's been asked a question. What serious objection is there to the doctrine of the Trinity? He answers, there are many objections which we might urge, but on account of our limited space, we shall reduce them to the three following. One, it is contrary to common sense. Two, it is contrary to scripture. Three, its origin is pagan and fabulous. What this man is saying is correct. It's not common sense. Uriah Smith, the scripture nowhere speak of Christ as a created being, but on the contrary, plainly state that he was begotten of the Father. They did not believe that Jesus is a created being. They believe that he's begotten or born of the Father. As we saw last night, there's a difference between begotten and created. Again, he goes on to say, God alone is without beginning. At the earliest epoch when a beginning could be, a period so remote that to finite minds it is essentially eternity appeared the Word, that is Christ. His beginning was not like that of any other being in the universe. It is set forth in the mysterious expressions, His, that is God's only begotten Son. So this man also believed, taught and wrote that Christ had a beginning of days. It doesn't make him any less divine because he had a beginning of days. As we saw last night, Christ's divinity is not based on his age. Christ's divinity is based on his sonship, his relationship to the Father, to the one true God. Uh, Haskell, he says, Back in the ages which finite mind cannot fathom, the Father and the Son were alone in the universe. Christ was the first begotten of the Father. So the Father and the Son were alone in the universe. There was no third being with them or a third person. John Madison, he says, Christ is the only literal Son of God, the only begotten of the Father. He is God because He is the Son of God, not by virtue of His resurrection. So why is Jesus divine? Why is Jesus God? Because He is the Son of God. That's exactly what we saw last night from the Bible. E.J. Wagner all things proceeded ultimately from God, the Father. Even Christ himself proceeded and came forth from the Father. That's from the book Christ and His Righteousness, the 1888 message. Wagner believed also that Christ came out from the Father in the days of eternity. He goes on to say, The angels are sons of God as was Adam by creation. Christians are the sons of God by adoption. But Christ is the Son of God by birth. The writer to the Hebrew, Hebrews further shows that the position of the Son of God is not one to which Christ has been elevated, 
but that it is one which he has by right or by inheritance. That's similar to what Ellen White said. Angels were sons of God by creation, Adam by adoption, by Christ is only begotten, remember? Wagner says the same thing. James White, that's Ellen White's son, not husband's son. He says, only one being in the universe besides the Father bears the name of God, and that is His Son, Jesus Christ. Only one being. There's no two other beings other than the Father. Only one. E.C. Wilcox, and he, he says, The Holy Spirit is the mighty energy of the Godhead, the life and power of God flowing out from Him to all parts of the universe. It thus makes Christ everywhere present. The Spirit er, is personified in Christ and God, but never revealed as a separate person. Notice what he says, Never are we told to pray to the Spirit, but to God for the Spirit. Never do we find in the Scripture prayers to the Spirit, but for the Spirit. I want you to keep this in mind because I will refer to it at the end of the presentation. The pioneers clearly taught that we are never to pray to this being called God, the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Spirit as we know it. We never taught in Scripture to pray to the Holy Spirit. Is this happening today? This makes you wonder. But keep it in mind, we refer to it. Now, what took place after the prophet and the pioneers started dying off? <coughs> I want you to pay attention to this uh, segment. In 1872, the Seventh-day Adventists got together and published James White, uh, particularly he's the one who wrote it, uh, with the help of others. They published the Fundamental Beliefs. Are you aware that in 1872 we had seven uh, fundamental beliefs? And in it we read, number one, that there is one God, a personal spiritual being, the creator of all things, omnipotent, unchangeable, and everywhere present by His representative, the Holy Spirit. The second one is that there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of the Eternal Father, the one by whom He created all things. And the third one is that the Holy Scripture of the Old and New Testament were given by inspiration of God. These were the fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in 1872. There's no Trinity there. There's no God, the Holy Spirit there, right? You can see it. The one God is the Father and Jesus, He is the <coughs> Son of God. This uh, statement of belief was printed from 1872 up till uh, the year 1914. From 1915 to 1930, no statement of beliefs was printed in the Adventist writings. What happened in these years? We'll find out. Alan White said, We have nothing to fear for the future except we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and His teachings in our past history. He said, If you hold on to your teaching in your past history, you have nothing to fear. But if you start forgetting them, you're in trouble. She also says, I tell you now that when I am laid to rest, great changes will take place. I do not know when I shall be taken, and I desire to warn all against the devi devices of the devil. God revealed to her that when you die, great changes will take place. In 1919, there was a Bible conference held. The, the Fathers of our faith, the pioneers of the church who were still alive at that time and few others came together to have a Bible conference in 1919. During that conference, we know of three men that tried to introduce the Trinity to the church. In 1919, <coughs> the, the, the minutes of the meeting are all recorded. You can find them and read them for yourself. The three men are H.C. Uh, Lacey, G.B. Thompson, and uh, F.M. Wilcox accepted it later in the 7th of July, 1919, accepted the Trinity. But notice some of the things, discussions that was happening at that time. During the discussion about the uh, Trinity, few men stood up and objected. This man, T.E. Bone, he said, Going back, for instance, to the place where Christ had a beginning, if we can comprehend such a fact, 
which is brought out in the scriptures, it would cease to be eternity. While they're discussing about the Trinity, this man said, hang on a second, Christ had a beginning. Another one, L. L. Kevins, he said, personally, I have not been able to accept the so-called Trinity doctrine that is as generally presented, that there are three persons in the Godhead and that there always were three. If that is the doctrine, I cannot quite agree with it because I was reading in the Bible yesterday in the book of John, which is the book which reveals to us the deity of Christ. As I understand it, his statement of the deity, of his deity rests upon his sonship. He goes on to say, there is another statement he makes. He says that the father who has life in himself gave the son to have life in himself. When, when that took place, I do not know, but I believe it took place somewhere away back in the eternity. I have to take Christ's word for it, that at some time that was true, that the Father had life in himself and he gave the Son to have life in himself. He is divine, but he is the divine Son. I cannot explain further than that, but I cannot believe the so-called Trinity doctrine of the three persons always existing. Just picture it in your mind. The pioneers in 1919 sitting together and discussing, having a Bible discussion, as many of us do today. And three men are trying to introduce the Trinity to the church. The prophet is dead. Some of the founders of the Adventist church are dead. Good, we can run loose now. But no, no, no. God had some faithful people and said, no, hang on a second. This Trinity you're talking about, I don't, I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense. It's not in Scripture. I was just reading last night about, you know, in the book of John and discussion. So the president at that time, A.G. Daniels, he concludes this discussion. He says, look, perhaps we have discussed this as long as we need to. We are not going to take a vote on Trinitarianism or, Ar or Arianism, but we can think. Let us go on with the study. So the president in 1919 said, <laughs> he probably the discussion got heated a bit, and he said, look, we're not going to take a vote on it today. Let, let's just forget about it now. Let's go home and think about it. But the point I'm trying to share with you is, if it is true as some theologians teach today that Ellen White in 1898, when she published The Desire of Ages, she turned the ship around and she started believing in the Trinity and teaching the Trinity, then she did a very, very poor job. Because in 1919, that's some 20 years later, the church was still not believing in the Trinity. If you want to tell me Ellen White turned the ship around and she started believing in the Trinity with the book, uh, The Desire of Ages, then you're saying that the prophet of the Lord failed in her mission. She did not tell the church who God is. She died keeping it a secret to herself. It doesn't make sense. <coughs> Froome. Any of you heard of Dr. L. E. Froome? He wrote a book in 1928, The Coming of the Comforter. It was the first book of its kind in the Adventist uh, faith, speaking about the Holy Spirit in the way he did. Where did Froome get his information from? He wrote, Froome wrote in his book, Movement of Destiny, that's year 1971, in page 322, he wrote and he said, May I here make a frank personal confession? When back between 1926 and 28, I was asked by our leaders to give a series of studies on the Holy Spirit. I found that aside from priceless leads found in the spirit of prophecy, there was practically nothing in our literature setting forth a sound biblical exposition in this tremendous field of study. There were no previous path finding books on the question in our literature. I was compelled to search out a source of valuable books written by men outside of our faith. Now, brethren, I, I want you to understand this. The three angels' messages were given around the 1844 and 45 and 46. What does the second angel message say? Babylon is falling, is falling, come out of her, my people. And all the people, the faithful people, came out from Babylon and they joined the true church that God established. Right? So at that time, the only church that God established 
was the Adventist church. What were the other churches regarded as? Babylon. So this man is telling you, I had to go to Babylon to find books written by Babylonian people about this God, the Holy Spirit, for me to learn and to teach you. That's what he's saying. Right? He's admitting it. That's what the man is saying. <coughs> Many ministers were not happy with his book and beliefs. H. W. Cottrell, in 1931, he wrote a letter to Froome. He wrote him a letter. And in the letter he says, The conclusion drawn at that time, the time of the pioneers, was the Holy Spirit was not a person in the sense that God and Christ are persons. And if it should be so, consider Christ would be the son of the Holy Spirit rather than of God as the Bible declares him to be. So Cottrell wrote a letter to Froome. He told him, listen, what, what your book is presenting, what your studies are presenting is not biblical. It's confusing. That's not what our father believed. Our fathers believed. They believed that the Holy Spirit is not a person like the Father and the Son. Plus, if what you're saying is correct, that the Holy Spirit is another being, another person, other than the Father and the Son, then Jesus will be the Son of the Holy Spirit. Do you know why? Because who came on Mary? The Holy Spirit came upon Mary and Mary was found of a child of the Holy Ghost. If the Holy Ghost is a different being than God the Father and Christ, then whose son is Jesus? He's not the son of the Father, he's the son of the Holy Spirit. These men used to think, you know, it's plain, say, hang on, if that's what you're saying, then Jesus is not the Son of God. Some knew that Froome was a dangerous man. In a letter from L.E. Froome to R.R. R. Figure in 53, Dr. Froome states, Froome is speaking here, and he says, I was publicly denounced in the chapel of the Washington Mission, Missionary College by Dr. B.G. Wilkinson as the most dangerous man in this denomination. <laughs> Some of the people back then who were awake knew that this man is onto something that is not good. This man, uh, B.G. Wilkinson, stood up in the church and he looked to, to Froome and told him, you are the most dangerous man in the denomination. <coughs> but what great changes took place after Ellen G. White and all the founders died? In 1931, remember I told you from 1915 to 1930, the fundamentals were not printed in our literature. In 1931, they were printed again. But that's how they were printed. Look at them. Number one, that the Holy Scripture of the Old and New Testament were given by inspiration of God. That was the third, now it's the first. The second one is that the Godhead or Trinity consists of the eternal Father, a personal spiritual being, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, infinite in wisdom and love. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the eternal Father, through whom all things were created, and through whom the salvation of the redeemed host will be accomplished, and the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, the great regenerating power in the work of redemption. I want to take this just a little bit slowly. In the fundamentals from 1872 to, uh, uh, to 1914, there was no such thing as Trinity. There was no such thing as God the Holy Spirit. In 1931, the term the Trinity was introduced and another element for the Holy Spirit, another one for the Holy Spirit as the third person of the Godhead was introduced. But notice something, it's written in a way that all of us can agree with. If you take that term Trinity just to mean three and you read what's actually a description is written, it tells you there is one God. And there is Jesus, who is the Son of the Eternal Father. And there is the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. That's what Ellen White said. Third there is no first and second person. You won't find that in the writings of Ellen White. She just says about the third person of the Godhead, just like you speak in a third person. Third person of the Godhead. God will be with us, not physically, through His Holy Spirit. If you look at it that way, you can agree with this, the way these fundamentals are written. But the devil is smart. He's got the time. People live and die, but he's still alive. And he's going, he says, no problem. I've got all the time I want. I'll introduce just the word, just the term Trinity now. And I'll put the definition of it in a way that the faithful can still agree with. 
just to keep them quiet. But the changes are still happening. And by the way, these fundamentals, they never went before the general conference in a session or, or any committee. Just few men sat together, wrote them and published them. End of story, just like that. Didn't go before a general conference or a meeting. Or, no, 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 no. <coughs> just underhanded. What did Willie had to say about the Trinity? Willie Ellen White's son. Now, notice what Ellen White said about her son Willie. She says, it was also shown me that my son, W.C. Watt or Willie Watt, should be my helper and my counselor, and that the Lord would place on him the spirit of wisdom and of sound mind. I was shown that the Lord would guide him and that he would not be led away because he would recognize the leading and guidance of the Holy Spirit. I will put my spirit upon your son and will strengthen him to do his work. He has the grace of humility. The Lord has selected him to act an important part in this work. For this purpose, he was born. God revealed this to Ellen White about her son, Willie. After Ellen White died, you go to Willie. Willie, what, what do you believe about the Trinity? Listen to what he says. The statements and the arguments of some of our ministers in their effort to prove that the Holy Spirit is an individual as our God the Father and Christ the Eternal Son have perplexed me and sometimes they have made me sad. One popular teaching said, teacher said, we may regard him, the Holy Spirit, as the fellow who is down here running things. That's in 1935. He says, the way the, the people are trying to, you know, bring in this trinity and say the Holy Spirit is a person as much as the Father, it perplexes me. It makes me sad. He didn't believe it. This uh, elder, Oscar, he wrote in uh, 1930 as well, although he was the literal son of God, although he was from everlasting, yet by the mightiest miracle of the infinite Father, he became also the son of man. Even up to 1930 and still further, we will see there were still some faithful men in the leading positions who were still teaching and upholding the truth, like this man. That's a letter from uh, Dr. Otto to Froome in 1960. Now we're 1960, okay? We're no longer in 1930 and, and 1960, close to us now. Look what he told him. He says, some time ago, I wrote you a long letter setting forth some of the reasons why I think your philosophy on the Holy Spirit and the soul are out of harmony with the scripture and the spirit of prophecy. I gave you reasons, yet I have had no response from you in regard to that. This concerns me very much because I feel that we ought to be together on these things so that we may present a united, not a confused front in the world. I have read and studied considerably on this topic and I have never before seen any of our ministers take the position which you are taking. So this man in 1960 wrote a letter to Froome and told him, listen, these things you're teaching in the coming of the Comforter and these things about the Spirit, they're weird. They're not scripture, scriptural. Our fathers did not teach them. I've given you reasons why it's wrong and you didn't reply to me. <coughs> Now, al Ifrum replies to him in 1960 as well. And he says, may I state that my book, The Coming of the Comforter, was the result of a series of studies that I gave in 27 and 28 to ministerial institutes throughout North America. You cannot imagine how I was pummeled by some of the old timers because I presented on the personality of the Holy Spirit as the third person of the Godhead. Some men denied that, still deny it. But the book has come to be generally accepted as standard. Now, I want you to understand what Froome is saying. He's telling this man, look, I know what you're saying. When I presented these studies, the old timers, the fathers of our faith, the founders of the church, they pummeled me with objections. They pummeled me with, with you know, uh, letters and whatnot that you're wrong and this and that. He says, but don't worry. The book has been published and it has been accepted as a fact. There's nothing you can do about it. This man from, I believe, knew what he's doing. 
And the thing is with Seventh-day Adventists, once they see a book and has the general conference stamp on it, they're like sheep blind. They read and accept everything written because the conference has stamped it. That's what man is camping on from. He's depending on it. He said, look, it's been published and accepted. There's nothing you can do about it. <coughs> How sad. How sad. That's not all. In 71, Dr. Froome wrote, the removal of the last standing visage of Arianism or anti-Trinitarianism in our standard literature was accomplished through the deletions from the classic Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith in 1944. Now many Adventists are not aware of that. In 1944, there was an illegal, underhanded, secret change of the book Daniel and Revelation. Are you aware of that? They went in that book and they took all the things that mentions that Christ at the beginning, Christ is the Son of God, they took them all out and changed them to suit the Trinity. In a letter by Elder Froome to Elder Reuben in 1955, listen to what he says. <coughs> he says, the revision involved the elimination of all the allusions to the Aryan view concerning Christ. Now, Uriah Smith, who wrote this book, we saw an earlier, a statement from him earlier. He said, I don't believe Christ is created. I believe he's begotten, right? He's saying, listen to what he says in here. Elder Dittwiller uh, was fearfully upset over this. When, when people, the leading, the other leading men knew what happened, past tense already, he was fearfully upset over this. His blood vessels stood out like whip cords on his neck and his face was red as a beet. And some people feared that he might have an attack of uh, apoplexy. Elder Spicer, the president at that time, was pretty warm also because of the changes made and the defenses in behalf of the book. The man is admitting, he's saying, look, when, when, when the leaders found out what we have done, one man almost had a heart attack, his veins almost popped, and the president was warm, was, was angry about it. But there's nothing you can do about it. It's been changed, it's been published, it's been stand by the conference, the people have it in their homes, and the people are ignorant like sheep. They will read it and accept it. That's what we see today. The result of these changes through the history that nobody is aware of. We see today all these people, all these generations coming up and they believe in the Trinity. It's an accepted fact. The Adventist church always believe in the Trinity. They have no idea what they're talking about. History. That which has been is that which shall be, Solomon says. There's nothing new under the sun. History tells you. Froome is admitting it. <laughs> now, in 1981, finally, finally, the fundamental beliefs. Notice how they changed from 72 to 31, 1981 now. The Holy Scripture, all the New Testament are the written word of God. Number two, the Trinity. There is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. A unity of three co-eternal persons. Number two, the Father. God, the eternal Father, number three, uh, four, sorry, the Son, God, the eternal Son, and number five, the Holy Spirit, God, the eternal Spirit. Can you see the changes? In 1872 up to 1914, there was none of this. Just God the Father and His Son. 1931, they introduced the term Trinity, but still the belief, the, the definition of it, we can agree with it. In 81, when all the faithful Pioneers of the faith died? Well, nobody can stop us now. Put it all in. Make it blunt. They're all blind anyway. They're all following. They have no idea. The relationship with the Godhead. That's from the Seventh-day Adventist Believe, page 30, uh, 23, 27 fundamentals. It says, the Godhead consists of God the Father, see chapter 3, God the Son, see chapter 4, God the Holy Spirit, see chapter 5, a unity of three co-eternal persons having a unique and mysterious relationship. From worshipping a God that we know who He is, the Father and His Son, from having the Father's name written on our foreheads, to now worshipping a mystery. Have anybody read Revelation 17, by the way? 
What's written on the forehead of the woman riding the beast? Mystery. Babylon the Great. God's people have the Father's name written on their forehead. The woman riding on the beast, the Antichrist system, have mystery written on, for, on her forehead. From 1872 to worshipping the fathers, Father, to 1981, worshipping a mystery. Did Satan have anything to do with that? Do you think, by any chance? We're almost done. And that's why now we have uh, writings like this. They tell you in this book, the Trinity, published by three authors from Andrews University with nice three sun circles to make the triquatra in the middle, uh, as you can see that. Uh, by the way, a circle of fire, what does that represent? The sun, right? The sun. Three suns, sun worship. And anyway, that's another presentation altogether. Listen to what they say. The first response to the logic of Trinitarianism thought is to admit that we are dealing with the profound of mysteries, profoundness of mysteries. In loving relationships, there does appear to develop a profound social or emotional oneness. Are we then to say that loving relationships are totally illogical and incoherent? We think not. And this seems to be the best way to give a coherent account of the mystery of the Trinity and its plural oneness. It's a mystery. You're worshipping a mystery. No wonder the, forehead, the woman has on forehead mystery. And as a result of this, we read in the same book, page 273, the oneness in nature and character of the three persons of the Godhead raises the very useful question of prayer. Praise and worship. But what about direct prayer to the Holy Spirit? While we have no clear example of or direct command to pray to the Spirit in Scripture, doing so does have in principle some implicit biblical support. It only seems logical that God's people can pray directly to and worship the Holy Spirit. Well, I'm glad it, it's logical to these men. Because that's the only evidence there is. It's logical to these men. But from the fathers who wrote, we do not worship the Holy... Remember I told you, keep the statement in your mind, I refer to it later. They said, we do not pray or worship the Holy Spirit. The Bible doesn't teach us to do so. To... Well, it makes sense to us that God's people should worship the Holy Spirit. Come on, people, start praying to the Holy Spirit. And blindly, like sheep following, they start praying to the Holy Spirit. No thinking. <coughs> As a result of that, we read, in 1993, most of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist, Adventism would not be able to join the church today if they had to subscribe to the denomination's fundamental beliefs, most specifically, most would not be able to agree to belief number two, which deals with the doctrine of the Trinity. That's published in the ministry magazine in 93 by George Knight. He's telling you, look, all the founders of the Adventist church, James White and Andrew and Wagner and all these, we won't accept them as members of the church. They don't qualify anymore because of the Trinity. The Bible warns us that we're told in Jude, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into less righteousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. False men, ungodly men, crept in on our words in the church. And as a result, we have what we have. And because of this infiltration, I'll just give you two examples just to see how close we have come to Babylon. Remember the guy from had to go to Babylon to get the teachings? He got the teachings in the church. We accepted this teaching and we worshiped that teaching. Now look how close we are to Babylon. Listen, in his testimony before a court of law in the U.S. 
the vice president of the conference, Neil C. Wilson, said, although it is true that there was a period in the life of the Seventh-day Adventist Church when the denomination took a distinctly anti-Roman Catholic viewpoint, that attitude on the church's part was nothing more than a manifestation of widespread anti-popery among conservative Protestant denominations in the early part of the century and the later part of the last, which has now been consigned to the historical trash heap as far as Seventh-day Adventist church is concerned. So grab your great controversy book and throw it in the trash, according to the vice president, because it is anti-popery. When you worship the God of the Pope, you're going to bow down to the Pope. Amen? Amen? When you worship the God of the Catholic system, you're going to bow down to the Catholic system, whether you like it or not. Another one said, that's Mitchell Tyner, the Associate General Counsel for the General Conference, wrote an article in the Colombian Union Visitors stating, the Pope and I descended from the same father. That makes us brothers who should not go around making personal attacks on each other. Differences, no matter how legitimate, would not justify the alienation of a member of the family. After all, the Pope and I are brothers. Well done. Well, of course, if you worship the same God, you are the sons of the same God, that makes you brothers, spiritual brothers. When you worship the God of the Catholic system, you are going to follow and bow down to the Catholic system as a result of committing fornication. That which was truth in the beginning is truth now. The present revealings do not contradict those of the past, the prophet said. She tells us also, those who seek to remove the old landmarks are not holding fast. They are not remembering how they have received and heard. Those who try to bring in theories that would remove the pillars of our faith concerning the sanctuary or concerning the personality of God or of Christ are working as blind men. They are seeking to bring in uncertainties and to set the people of God adrift without an anchor. Those men who bring new ideas about the personality of God and of Christ. We saw what the prophet and the founders uh, of the church believed about the personality of God and Christ, right? She says those who will bring a new ideas about the personality of God and Christ, they will set the people adrift. You have no anchor anymore because you're going to let go of the foundations and just go adrift. That's what she said. And we'll close with this statement. Truth is truth and will remain truth and in the end will triumph gloriously. Mm -hmm. The truth, brothers and sisters, will triumph whether you are on its side or not. God wants you to be on the side of the truth. Satan wants you to be on the side of error. The deciding vote is yours. I just hope and pray that this makes sense. As I said, our foundation, we establish our faith on the Word of God. We saw that last night plainly. But to add to that, as Adventists, we want to know our history, where we come from, what did the Prophet and the Founders believe. And we saw clearly that the Prophet and the Founders of our faith agreed with what the Scriptures revealed. What will you believe? That's for you to answer. Let us close with a prayer.